And thanks everybody for joining, uh, joining us here again for another crisis conversation live from my uh, social distancing home office. Um, uh, today, we're, what we're really wanting to dig into is the lives of frontline healthcare workers. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen so much uh, about uh, the lack of personal protective equipment and uh, a lot of what what a lot of frontline workers are facing uh, as they as they confront this really frightening and uh, potentially deadly disease. And so today, I want to kind of take it a little step further and talk about how that's affecting not only work uh, and life. Um, but really use this as an opportunity to, to ask the question, what can we learn? What can we learn from this experience? I think we've all been now social distancing long enough that, that we started these conversations with the idea that we would come together and share stories in our, in our isolation and try to understand this kind of this very fast moving pandemic and how it was affecting our work and life. And I think that we can still do that, but we're, we're settle, sort of settling into a kind of crazy new normal. And I think now is the time to ask, what can we learn and how can we emerge from this better and stronger? Um, what are some bright spots, uh, things that we can learn? But let me start first with Dennis. Uh, Dennis, let's turn over to you. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. You're a, a, a nurse in Chicago. Um, when, I, when I talked to you and heard your story about uh, sort of what you were experiencing at work and how that was affecting you at home. Uh, it was an incredibly powerful story. So let me turn it over to you, introduce yourself and just uh, uh, tell us sort of a day in the life of Dennis Kosin. Sure, yeah. You know, I've been uh, a registered nurse for about 13 years. Most of that time I've worked at Cook County uh, Hospital in Chicago, which is the biggest public health hospital in the, in the area. I worked in the ER there for about eight years. For the past four years, I've been working at Chicago Public Schools as a school nurse, um, and then part-time, I work at Provident Hospital, which is down on uh, the south side of Chicago for the last two and a half years. I, I go there one, one, one day a week. Um, and I, th I think the thing that, that I've learned about this, and I've, I've known this ever since I went in, even before, but nursing really highlighted for me the disparity between what it means to become a nurse, and then the kind of uh, environment that we're dealing with. We're told that we're, when we're in school, that we're going to be helping people, that we're going to be uh, providing health care, fixing people's health, and all the rest. But that's true. That's 100% true. But there's a gap between what we're able to do and um, what, can, what what's needed. And, and, and I think this COVID uh, pandemic has really sh shown a spotlight on that disparity between what's needed so, so far and, and what we have. Uh, in Chicago, as, as people may have heard, and which is true in a lot of cities, um, while African Americans only make up about 30% of the population, they're over 70% of the deaths in, in, in Chicago. And that's really um, horrifying, but it's also, on, on another level, not surprising um, because, because the way healthcare is, is, is run in this country, where it's basically focused on what makes money, unfortunately, mm -hmm. rather than what's needed for people. And so I think it's, it's really shown a spotlight on that disparity. You know, if we could keep talking sort of about this big picture, you know, the CDC came out with a new report this week about how many frontline health workers are infected. I think the number was 9,000. But again, I don't know how widespread testing is, so we don't even know right. if that's a real number. Right. Uh, and, and that, but, uh, you know, of those, there are about 27 deaths, and many of them uh, are um, white middle-aged women, sort of the okay. kind of the backbone of the nursing population. Okay. You know, Talk to us about what is that like to you know, your your job. You know, you're there yeah. to, like you say, give care and and care for right. others. Um, what's that like when you you know when the job itself could be very very dangerous and actually, you know, uh, I, I'm searching for the right word. I don't want to say detrimental, but potentially could harm your own health and your own care. Absolutely, yeah. No, and I and I myself had an incident when I worked on the afternoon of March 20th. I went down to the ER. I was, I was supposed to only work an eight-hour shift. Ended up being a 16-hour shift because there was so many people, so many nurses called in sick. We couldn't. Mm. I, I stayed over to help out, and then I got a call a few days later saying I had been exposed to two patients who had tested positive. And this was after I'd already, you know, gone home that Saturday morning. I lived with my my wife. Uh, and my 12-year-old, and upstairs from us are my wife's parents. You know, they're in their mid-70s. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law has significant health issues, and and the worst thing that was going through my mind was like, oh my God, I've just, you know, brought something home that's horrible unknowingly, and so mm -hmm. that was really was really difficult for me. And so, but I'm also on the same hand, I'm relatively fortunate. Like I have a, 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 a 
a job that pays living wage. We, we have a house that I could be done in my basement and be there for five, five uh, days while awaiting my res results. It, but it just made me think about all the families who don't have those same kind of resources. I mean, in the schools, so many of the families that I work with as a nurse, they will have five people in a basement that is one yeah. bedroom and they have a, a, a job that doesn't have the uh, sick time. They don't, they can't call in sick. They can't not send their kids to school when they're sick. And so I, I think about those things as the reasons why this condition has spread so far so fast in this country is because we just don't have basic things that most other countries have is like, when you're sick, you shouldn't go to work. When your kids are sick, they should stay home. But yeah. if you don't get paid when you're not sick, or if you, if you are sick and you can't isolate yourself, it's going to spread through your, through your conditions in a, in a much sharper way, especially for, for poor people and people of color. You know, you'd also talked about the, you know, the hospital on the south side, the ER, where you, where you work yeah. once a week, that that's also closing in the middle of a pandemic, which, I, you know, you were saying you'd never see that in a wealthier community. So what are you doing? Right. What are you doing now? I mean, so it, it was really stunning. And the way they did it was really stunning. We, I, I, my wife found out that my ER was closing through the newspaper. There's a, a local journal called Crane Chicago Business. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, it's, it's a business magazine. And it was just odd that, that, the, that Cook County was saying, well, we communicated to the people. Providence is located on the south side of Chicago in, in the Washington Park neighborhood. Um, I don't believe that Crane Chicago business has a, high, has a very high subscription rate in that area. I'm just, I'm just guessing that I don't have data on that. But the fact that they would just in two days tell the people, tell the nurses, oh, by the way, your emergency room is closing. That would never have happened in a, in a community where like Northwestern Memorial Hospital is located, where Illinois Masonic is located. Those are both much more wealthy, well-resourced areas. Washington Park is not one of those areas. There's, mm -hmm. There was a study done a couple of years ago, the difference between life expectancy in Washington Park, which is where Provident serves, and Hyde Park. Hyde Park has the University of Chicago. It's a very well-endowed uh, institution. I think they're, they're, they have eight billion. And they, uh, their life expectancy there is 14 years greater in Hyde Park than Washington Park. Um, so that was just stunning that you would close an ER that serves a, a community of color in the middle of a pandemic. It was stunning to me. And they said it was for safety reasons. They said that one nurse tested positive. Show me a hospital anywhere in the country that has not had a healthcare provider test positive when, if they're treating COVID patients. It's part of the, it's part of the, the picture, but none of them, I guarantee none uh, no institution around the world who, who has a, a worker test positive has shut down. So in the meantime, they basically said the nurses go, you know, we're going to send you to other places. You can work at Stroger, which is their main campus, or the, the CIRMAC, which is the hospital that serves Cook County Jail. So I mm -hmm. opted to go work at the jail, uh, and I was there Easter Sunday. I'm going to be going there again this coming Sunday. So I want to talk with you about that and, wh and what that's like, uh, you know, because you talked about you're in Illinois, and I think the CDC statistics also show, like, the death rate uh, for African Americans is five yeah. times that for, uh, for white Americans. And so I want to go back and talk to you more about the, the prison, but at this point, you know, I'd love to bring in Lynn. Lynn is an emergency room doctor um, in the Washington, D.C. area. And Lynn, when uh, when I was talking to you, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned Dennis was uh, was was exposed to, to COVID and, you know, you isolated in the basement. Um, you're still living with your with your husband and, and your daughter. And you were talking about the sort of the steps that you go to try to protect protect them really and protect yourself can you just sort of walk us through a day in the life of how you like just go to work and come home from work sure i'm happy to do that um yeah i you know my process has changed quite a bit from uh how my job was uh, a couple of months ago um uh, in order for me to to go to work i, I generally uh get dressed i um i i put my cell phone in in two plastic bags um i go get in my car and drive into work in, in one outfit. Um, when I get there, I change my shoes. I put on the second outfit. Um, I put my mask and my, my gear on, and then I go into the department. Um, and then while I'm there, I, I change uh, my protective uh, covering multiple times throughout my shift. Uh, and then um, at the end of my shift, I wipe everything down, my shoes, my badge, everything. Um, I change again and bag up my clothes, um, go to my car, change my shoes, um, drive home, 
I put that bag in a bag on my porch (laughs) and then I grab another, um, I take my clothes off on my porch. So that's now two sets of clothes. Um, I go inside, uh, and then I shower, uh, and then I come out. Uh, and so I, I definitely think it, it, it adds a lot and I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know if that's enough or if that makes any sense at all. Um, but you know, I think the thing that struck me is that this is a new disease and it's a disease I've only known for four months, uh, as compared to any other disease I've studied in my career. Uh, so there's a little bit of science out there, but what I know is that we're not sure about the spread of the disease. And because of that, I'm trying to be as careful as I can. So you were saying that, it, so even though you're you're still at home, you're trying to separate as much as you can from your family. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing and, and, and then what that what that's like? What, what's the impact now on your family uh, with you kind of being so separate? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm lucky enough that I have a separate area in my home, which I know a lot of uh, healthcare workers do not. Um, and I am uh, in my uh, spare bedroom um, where I have a bathroom next to me and I've walled that off um, and I no one else uses it. Uh, and I, I stay in there almost all the time. I come out uh, for meals. Um, But I'm trying to minimize how much of um, the air that uh, I breathe out of my oro and nasal pharynx goes into my family. Mm. You know, when you, so how old is your, is your daughter and sort of what are, you know, what goes through your mind as you're going through all of this, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, her and her care and, you know, is that hard for you to, you know, be so separate and is your husband really stepping up or really having to because you're, you know, because you don't want to breathe the same air? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I uh, I have a toddler. And so that's hard, you know, because she hears you in the house. So, you know, initially, we thought maybe I would just stay completely isolated, but um, that that really wasn't possible. And um, I have some colleagues who also have toddlers, and they've had to make the difficult decision of do they stay in their homes or or do they send their toddlers uh, away to live with their spouses uh, in other states. And I I would say um, people have done both things. so it's definitely weird. You'll you'll hear her crying and you're like, oh, I need to wash my hands and then come out and how many times do I want to go in and out and that sort of thing. So what's it, what's it been like for your husband? You know, we had had a crisis conversation a couple of weeks ago about how women tend to do uh, about twice the housework and childcare, even when they're working full time. And that this, you know, the, this coronavirus is really upending a lot of that potentially, uh, particularly among health workers, where it's like 78% of all nurses are, are women. And you see stories about, you know, like you'd mentioned a, a couple of people, um, you know, nurses are staying at hotels or they're staying completely uh, in different places to stay away from their families it, you know kind of what's happening you know in your own in your own home with uh, you know with your husband sort of not only doing the physical labor but all of that invisible mental labor that that women tend to do when it comes to caregiving and housework yeah I, I think it's definitely hard um I you know in addition to my clinical work my non-clinical work has increased uh, and in addition to just you know reading about this disease and trying to learn as much as you can so uh, because of that uh, he's trying to work while also watching her, uh, and then uh, he processes and orders all the food, um, makes the meals, uh, and then he's trying to make sure that she's occupied, so coordinating um, Zoom parties or um, almost virtual babysitting with grandparents on the iPad while you're taking a call at work, uh, and and all kinds of things like that. Mm. So, well, thanks so much, Lynn. You know, you you talked about, um, next, I'd really like to bring Ramon in. Ramon is a nurse practitioner in the New York area, which, as we all know, has been one of the, just the, the hardest hit uh, outbreak areas. Um, uh, and Ramon, you also have family, and you're like one of the, like many of the people that we're talking about, you're actually living separate from them. Can you talk a little bit about um, your own, uh, you know, your own story, your own experience, and what's happening with your family. Sure, yes, thank you. So, you know, I've been a nurse for about 13 years, um, an NP for about five. Um, I'm married. My wife is about five months pregnant right now. I have a three-year-old son. Um, I actually, you know, uh, have been working in the outpatient world in the last few years. Uh, so when this all started, um, we started to work from home a little bit. Um, but as soon as, you know, the work from home days were over, 
um, I decided it probably would be best to move out. I mean, having worked in the ER during the times of the H1N1 flu, you know, I, I realized that it, it, because this was such a new enemy and such a dangerous enemy that, you know, I should just probably move out. Um, mm. We also live with my mother-in-law who's, you know, in her seventies. So um, luckily a family friend, you know, was more than happy to give their apartment, you know, for a healthcare worker. Um, so I moved here and, you know, about one week after moving here, um, they actually uh, redeployed us to the floors in the hospital to help mm. out. Um, so I worked in COVID units and non-COVID units. Um, and at that time I had, you know, actually felt very glad that I did move out a week before because, you know, I didn't know that I would be going to a COVID unit initially. Um, and I did, I wouldn't know what, I don't know what I would have done if mm. I had to come home from work and that day figure out where to go and what to do, you know? You know, you were you were saying too when we were um, kind of talking and getting ready for this podcast that um, so your wife is five months pregnant. You've got the this young toddler, and so she's not able to work uh, because she's in a position that you're you're right. In a in a sense, it's a privilege to be able to work from home. I'm very privileged that I can work from home. Many people can't, but then the people who you know who are also trying to do childcare on top of that, that's also in, almost impossible to try to do both at the same time. We Last week, we talked to Sarah, who uh, is kind of basically a single mom because her husband's overseas with two kids, and her job just didn't understand. Why couldn't she keep working and try to take care of a one and a three-year-old? It's literally impossible to try to do that. Um, so you were talking about your wife is now taking time off, but that's eating into time that she was hoping to have for maternity leave, which is sort of another huge problem that we have in this country. We're the only country that also doesn't have a paid maternity leave policy. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and, and sort of um, what she's experiencing in, in all of this with you? And, and you're, not, you're not there because you're trying to protect them, you, so you can't help in that situation. What's, what's this like for your wife? Yeah, so I mean, during all this time of change, um, our daycare also closed down, understandably. Um, to help stop the spread of disease. Um, and so my wife, who initially did try working from home, is unable to because now she has become the only parent in the home and also is the only person taking care of the household, mm -hmm. um, which is terrible to think about on my end because I'm kind of powerless to help. But on her end, she has had to take uh, days off and use her paid time off. Um, which, you know, we were hoping would come in handy during her maternity leave. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it is really tough for her and for, you know, our family. Um, and, you know, the, the fallout from this will be, you know, months and probably years to come. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Dennis, let's go back to you and pick up where we left off. You were talking about, you know, so now that you're at the ER in the south side of Chicago and this very hard hit area has closed down inexplicably, now you're going into the into the prison and, yeah. and helping there, which, you know, as we know from reports is, I, I think that at one point was, was sort of the most infected, highest infected yep. rate in you know, in yeah. the country. So yeah. what, what are you seeing there? And what do you, what are, again, what are we learning that we can, that, that we need to do better in the right. future? I mean, it's, it's, it is impressive to me. It's a lot of the things that we're learning are things that are known in the sense that there are horrible inequalities when it comes to how healthcare is distributed in this country. Um, un learning about underlying reasons why there are these life expectancy differences, like I was saying between Hyde Park and Washington Park, you know, just one street separates 14 years of life. That's mm. just uh, stunning. And that should have been uh, a three alarm uh, bell ringing for, for years and should have been cared for. And so this, I think, has exacerbated these, uh, COVID has exacerbated these underlying conditions. So in the jail, there's constant issues with short staffing with nursing. So some the people I took care of uh, were, on, on the one hand, just horribly afraid. Um, three detainees have already died from, from coronavirus uh, mm. that they caught in the jail. There's hundreds of, of detainees that have it. It's worth remembering that a lot of these people in the jail are not there because they've necessarily been convicted of anything. Thousands of the people who are there are there simply because they're too poor to afford bail. They don't, they don't have the $500, it might as well be $5 million. For, for people who, uh, for many people in this city, to, they can't just get out. And so 
they're stuck there. Um, this state ended the death penalty, you know, in 2011, but it has functionally in some ways been reinstated by not allowing these people who are there, some, many of them for nonviolent charges, just awaiting trial. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the city says, well, it's too dangerous, not, not physically of, of the communities, but it's too dangerous to set these people out because they may infect others. And, and my response to that is right now in downtown Chicago, there are literally thousands of empty hotel rooms. The, the tourism industry obviously is, is, is on a huge break right now. Right, um, right. So why not put these uh, people who are just awaiting trial, who many of them who are there for nonviolent, like traffic violations, whatever, let them stay at the Palmer House, let them stay at the Intercontinental, have them there for two weeks, they can do a, a wellness check on them on a regular basis, and then they can go back to their communities. There's certainly solutions that could be put forward um, for, for many of these detainees in, in the jail. And I, and I hope that the county starts making the better decisions. Oh, man, what an amazing story. And, you know, uh, I love that thinking big about how we could really try to use this crisis to learn and, and really do things better, emerge as a better place, a better country. You know, at this point, I want to move uh, uh, one of the participants, um, Ann Hoffman, posed a question in the chat. So, Ann, let's bring you up and, and have you pose the question, and then we'll have all the panelists uh, respond. Hi, yeah, thanks for, uh, for piping me in here. My name's Ann. Um, I teach at a community college in the DC area. And many of my students are, are single mothers, um, mostly primarily women of color. And many of them are nurses aides working in nursing homes and hospice settings. And at the same time, they're also um, working towards nursing credentials and mothering. So you can imagine how the COVID situation has impacted their lives in these really um, profound and heartbreaking ways because while they must continue to work, um, they also are trying to continue to work online um, towards their credentials and uh, in their college classes. And their, their kiddos are home, also mm -hmm. trying to now manage e-learning. Um, and so, and at the same time, they're getting sick. Uh, one student lost her ex-husband this week to Corona, um, and he is the primary financial resource for the family. Oh, wow. So I have this question about how can we, in higher ed, as we're thinking big about, um, you know, how these different systems articulate and how they can come together, how can we in higher education or in training programs address and protect these lower level healthcare workers who, know, who don't yet have the credentials Right, and the, um, all of the, the different supports and access to health, uh, well, they probably have access to healthcare, but actually in some case they don't, um, and disrupt the gendered and racialized class stratified lab labor pipelines that are gonna continue to unevenly impact these populations if they can't get these credentials, right? So that's my question. Do you, what suggestions do you, have, do you have and how can we think about um, you know, higher ed who is gonna be getting actually a tremendous amount of money through the CARES Act to, to funnel some of maybe some of these supports towards those, those students. Well, let's start with, with Dennis. Um, those are, so those are yeah. excellent, uh, excellent and troubling questions. How do yeah, we emerge? No. What do we do? How do we emerge I, better with that? For those who are, who are seeing this through the Zoom, I'm definitely not the face of what nursing looks like in, in the Chicago area by any stretch. I'm, I'm a Chinese person, I'm, I'm, I identify as male, but most of my coworkers, most of them I went to nursing school with, are people of color, uh, women. Most of the nurses I work with at Chicago Public Schools are in that demographic. My feeling as far as, the, there, I don't know if there's a short-term solution to, to the caller's question, but I think the long-term solutions have to be examined. Why is it that nurses come out of school with tens of thousands of dollars in debt. That makes no sense to me. If you wanna go into investment banking or be you know, some kind of uh, money maker, real estate uh, tycoon, fine, you gotta pay for your own school, that makes sense. But if you wanna go into a, a field that's about taking care of people, that's about improving people's lives, that's about giving back to your communities, why should you be paying for school? Why should you be coming out of your education? I'm sorry to shout and get excited, but come <laughs> out of this in, in debt. That makes absolutely no sense. There should be a free school for anybody who wants to become a teacher, a nurse, a social worker. I mean, those are just the names off the top of my head, things that actually contribute to society. There should be childcare provided to those people who want to pursue the education so they can be supported. Um, a lot of the people I went to nursing school with, I went to Malcolm X College, a community college. I really uh, appreciate what the, uh, the, the, the questioner asked about it. That's, that's who goes to those schools and they need to be put more resources to that. And there's resources that exist out there. Why is it that Wall Street these big companies are being given this bailout of 
millions and billions of dollars while people who are actually doing work you know, are not getting that same kind of relief. We need to examine so many things out of this crisis. And I really hope that we are continue to fight for the changes that we need. All right, awesome. Uh, Lynn or uh, Ramon, do you, sure. do you have, have some thoughts? start with Lynn? I, I can speak a little bit, sure. Um, one of the things I noticed in emergency medicine is that nurses um, come and they're very excited and then they often uh, about mid-career decide to go and leave and you get a nurse practitioner degree or a doctorate in nursing. And so there's a major drain of these mid-career nurses out of the emergency departments. And I think if we had a system where we rewarded nurses for being good clinical nurses monetarily, perhaps we wouldn't be pushing them into other fields and uh, the emergency departments and other departments within the hospital could reap the benefits of, of having those people uh, stay around longer and teach our new learners. That's an excellent point. You know, Ramon, what do you, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, something I realized um, a long time ago that is kind of coming to light now is that you don't see someone walking down the street in scrubs and think, oh my God, they're putting their life on the line. You know, mm -hmm. um, you see a police officer, a firefighter, you know, an EMT, you may think that. Um, but I think that people are seeing that healthcare workers, you know, are on the front lines and do deal with things in the emergency room that are unknown to them and they're bringing these dangers home to their families and putting themselves at risk. And, you know, the people that are training or, you know, parenting during this time, they don't have an easy choice. Um, you have to go to work. You want to go to work. You want to help. You want to be a good parent. Um, and there's, there's a very hard balance. I mean, like Lynn is saying, all the steps she takes, I mean, that adds hours into your day going to work, coming home from work you know, it's, it's really trying and you still don't know if that's enough. Um, yeah. It's really tough. You know, I see that we're coming down on time. And so I did want to add, I wanted to go back to Dennis and, and uh, Lynn and Ramon, if you had some thoughts to just, you know, here, here again, we have a crisis and it's, it's really showing what's fraying, what's broken, what's near, what's, what's breaking in, in the United States you know, what, what do we need to do next? What's, you know, Dennis, let's start with you. You've, you've yeah. mentioned a lot of really important um, systems that are broken right. and breaking. Uh, yeah. You know, what do we do? Uh, what do we learn out of this? And who needs to be in charge of making these changes? I think right now it's clear that, that healthcare providers and, and justifiably so are being held up in the media, in public, as, as, as Ramon was saying, as, as Lynn was saying, as these heroes that are going in. And that's true, but I think that's, that's half the story. We have been working in conditions that, that are, would be considered embarrassing in any other country that has an, a similar economy. And these are chronic uh, disparities that have existed in this country for decades, uh, if not for decades, for centuries. And so I feel personally as a healthcare, as a person who participates in providing healthcare, we need to lift up our voices to not just talk about ourselves as heroes, but talk about the fundamental things that are broken. Why is there not sick time for people? Why is there disparities when it comes to healthcare? Why, are there not, why do we have a for profit healthcare system? All those things are things that we need to be shouting from the rooftops right now towards changing things fundamentally. Right, as well as talking about the mass incarceration that you're, that you're now facing at the jail. 100%. Yeah, so Lynn, uh, do you have some final thoughts about what do we learn from this? Sure, I, I think that emergency medicine needs to be given surge capacity. You know, uh, we always operate with our, our emergency departments at 120% full. Uh, and when something like this happens, uh, it's very hard to respond. Yeah. All right. Great thoughts. Ramon, the last word goes to you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just like Dennis and Lynn were saying, you know, we are always working at capacity with limited resources. And I think this uh, pandemic has actually brought those to light. And I really hope that it can be fixed moving forward. But we do have to, you know, point it out to, you know, everyone and people that can make change to make All that right. happen. All right, and this is this is that we're trying to play our part in that, trying to bring these voices to light, bring these conversations to light, making sure that workers have a voice, making sure that the public l really understands how these systems are broken and gets behind the kind of larger policy changes that we need, the investments and the uh, you know the kind of the larger workplace cultural changes that we need, and and what we can do as individuals, you know, and how we all need to be understanding and 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 pushing for these kinds of changes. So I want to thank. 
thank Dennis, Lynn, Ramon. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing your stories. I want to thank all of the participants who have uh, uh, chimed in in the chat. And thank you so much for being part of uh, the, the conversation today. I want to thank my amazing Better Life Lab team, uh, the amazing New America event staff, David Schulman, an amazing producer. Thank you so much for helping us put these conversations together. Next week, we're going to be talking to Kelly Yost, who is a remote and flexible work strategist. We've been all doing this, for, you know, many of us for a month. What are we, what are we learning? What, how is this going to change the future of work? And what about the people who can't work remotely? What does this mean for future work systems? So thank you all so much for joining today. Wash your hands, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.